Tonight, all eyes on Tennessee. A heated race reaches a boiling point. Two candidates. I'm Marsha Blackburn. I'm Phil Bredesen. From two sides of the aisle. On the conservative side, she's the 800-pound gorilla. The only Democratic politician with even a fighting chance. Go head to head on one stage. Dubbed the single most important Senate race in the country. The results could tip the scales in Washington with polls showing a dead heat. This one is too close to call. An attack. 16 years in Washington and it shows. Coming from both sides. A wrong answer. Your chance to hear from the candidates in their final debate before election night. Your local election headquarters welcomes you to tonight's Tennessee Senate debate. We are broadcasting live from the Baker Center on the University of Tennessee's campus in Knoxville. I'm Katina Rankin, evening anchor for WATN in Memphis, and I will be your guide this evening for the Next Star Media Group presentation. Let's go right ahead and introduce you to the candidates who are running for U.S. Senate. Former Tennessee Governor Bill Bredesen and Congressman Marsha Blackburn, representing Tennessee's 7th District. And tonight, we are broadcasting live all across the state of Tennessee. We welcome viewers from stations in Memphis, Jackson, Nashville, Chattanooga, Johnson City, Knoxville, and Huntsville, Alabama. Now, let's meet the panel of journalists who will be asking the tough questions tonight. We have Richard Ransom, anchor at WATN in Memphis, Kristen Farley, anchor at WATE in Knoxville, and Bob Mueller, anchor at WKRN in Nashville. Now, here's a quick rundown of tonight's debate rules. There are no opening statements. Candidates will have 30 seconds each for closings. Candidates will get 60 seconds to answer main questions and 30 seconds for rebuttals. If there is a follow-up question, candidates will get 30 seconds and the sound of a bell it will ring when the time is up. And be sure to follow the hashtag TN Senate Debate. There you can find all background information on the questions that will be asked tonight, as well as information on the candidates. But now let's get right to the questions. We're going to begin with Bob, who is up first. Thank you, Katina. Congressman and Governor, thank you for taking part in our debate tonight. Good evening and welcome. I'd like to start with a couple of your stated views on the issue of the allegations and confirmation of Judge Kavanaugh to the U.S. Supreme Court. Governor, you said in Nashville, evidence supporting the sexual assault allegations did not rise to the level of disqualifying Kavanaugh. And Congressman, you told the Times Free Press of Chattanooga the sexual assault allegations were raised by the Democrats as a delay tactic and a smear. Are you both saying you did not believe the accusers, including Christine Blasey Ford, who under oath said 100 percent it was Brett Kavanaugh who assaulted her? Governor Bredesen, you get the first answer. Thank you. And I want to say, first of all, uh, thanks to the Baker Center for their uh, hospitality here tonight. Uh, the last time I was in this room uh, was several years ago at a, a forum with two other Tennessee governors, both Republicans, on civility and politics. And uh, Howard Baker was sitting down in the, uh, uh, in the front row. And um, I've just, uh, he stood in so many ways for that, for civility and politics. I'm very hopeful that uh, despite all the negative advertising and so on, we can have a, that kind of a civil debate tonight. Um, I wanted to take my time uh, with this because I think the obligation of a senator uh, is, to, um, is to consider all the facts and not simply come out ahead of time uh, with, uh, because of the person's party. Um, I watched it very closely, and uh, finally I just came to the conclusion that uh, all things being equal, I did not think that those uh, allegations rose to the level of disqualification uh, from the Supreme Court. Uh, I really... I'm thank sorry. you, Governor. Okay. Congressman, did you not believe the accusations? Uh, first of all, I want to say thank you to the Baker Center and also to Tennesseans that are watching tonight. Uh, we are thinking of those that have friends and family in the pathway of the storm, and we hope that they are that they are going to be safe. Uh, Phil, welcome back. I know that he went home to New York to meet with Michael Bloomberg, raise some money, talk about gun control, and could have even talked a little bit about being a running mate in 2020. When it comes to the issue of uh, Judge Kavanaugh, Tennesseans wanted to see Judge Kavanaugh confirmed. Now, if Hillary Clinton, who Phil supported to be president, gave her $33,400, if she had been president, you would not have had a Judge Kavanaugh. And it took Phil a while to make his mind up 
on this issue, and he finally did. It could have been because of the sexual harassment claims in his administration when he was governor. He actually said that he didn't think Thank men you, and women. Governor, you get to respond. <clears throat> that was possibly the shortest civil debate we've had in a long, a long time. Um, to finish my thought on, on Judge Kavanaugh, um, I really believe that it's vitally important that this subject of sexual harassment and so on not be weaponized in the way that it was in this. I thought both parties uh, did not advance the cause at all. Um, I wanted to take my time, came to a decision, and I'm satisfied with it. Thank you, Governor. Congressman, you get to respond. Yes, you know, Phil said that he did not think that men and women, when they were in the workplace together, you just had these issues of sexual harassment. I think that is something that is an insult to women who are in the workplace, and maybe he thinks I ought not to be on this stage tonight. But the point is, you need to be certain that judges who are constitutionalist judges, like Judge Kavanaugh, are going to be there. And if Phil had had his way and Hillary was going to be president, you would not have had these Thank judges. Thank you, Congressman. Governor, as a follow-up to the, to the Kavanaugh question, you said there was really no politically good answer to this. And some in your party are now criticizing you for supporting Kavanaugh. Your opponent, as you heard, is criticizing you for taking too long and claiming you only came out in support of Kavanaugh after the confirmation was a done deal. If you had to do this again with more information, would there be a different outcome? Well, I, if I had to do the process again with what we have, no. I mean, what I wanted to do was to listen to it, to uh, not say, as the congressman did within t 20 seconds of him being nominated, that he should be confirmed, to actually have hearings and find out information. Obviously, a lot of stuff came up at the end of that process, and um, I think we went appropriately. I wish there had been a lot more information that a, a real FBI uh, investigation of those charges had been made. That certainly could have changed my mind in the outcome. Thank you, Governor. Congressman, as a follow-up, on Monday during the swearing-in ceremony, President Trump called the whole process a hoax and said all of the allegations of sexual assault against Justice Kavanaugh were fake statements, horrible statements that were totally untrue. Do you agree with the President? What we found out through the process with Justice Kavanaugh is that this was a, pretty much a, a stunt by the Democrats. The Washington Democrats had said early on that they were going to do everything that they could possibly do in order to be able to block this nomination. And we saw that they did this. This was character assassination. It was a dirty politics. Tennesseans knew that. They wanted to see Justice Kavanaugh confirmed. And I said early on, after reviewing, Did I would support him. Did you not believe the allegations? I'm certain something happened to Dr. Ford at some point in her life. Thank you, Congressman. Thank yes. you, Governor. Kristen? All right, Bob, thank you. We're going to continue now with the Kavanaugh line of questioning here. As you know, Dr. Christine Blasey Ford testified that Justice Kavanaugh sexually assaulted her more than 35 years ago when the two were attending high school. If your child or grandchild was in Dr. Ford's shoes, would have you advised him or her to come forward with these allegations? Congressman, we're going to start with you. Absolutely, and I think one of the things of the Me Too movement, which is a benefit, is that our daughters and our granddaughters know that when they make a complaint, that they are going to be listened to. And like so many women, when you feel the sting of discrimination or discounting or diminishment or condescension or harassment, you just abhor all of that in every single form. And the good thing is that the shame is on the perpetrator now. And you know that is where the shame is going to be placed. And that is a positive. It is not placed on the victim at this point. Now, we know that Phil had issues in his administration. There was a path for friends of Phil where sexual harassment claims were handled. And there was also the path for everyone else. And what happened? The voices of those women were shredded. They died in that shredder. Congressman, thank you. Uh, Governor, would you advise your child or grandchild to go public with these allegations? You know, at the, uh, today, with the sensitivity that we have to these issues, I certainly would, yes. I certainly also understand that uh, uh, back 30 years ago, uh, the conditions were different and someone, someone might have felt differently. I also understand, remember, my wife is someone who has worked for 30 years 
uh, with victims of sexual sexual abuse and, and both women and, and children. And she's also, I mean, I mean, taught me a lot about um, all the impediments that there are to women coming forward and all the reasons why someone might not step out at that particular point. So I don't consider the fact of someone not coming forward at the time to be an issue uh, at all in that uh, in that regard. You know, in regard to this, the congressman keeps talking about this stuff in my administration. We had an issue with someone. We got rid of that person the next day. We tried to help the victim every way we could. We do not maintain notes of those because they're public records. The reason we don't maintain notes is to help the victim. Governor, thank you. Congressman, 30 seconds for rebuttal. Uh, yes, what we know is that the women uh, probably lost their job or they were told they could resign. The guys got promoted. The friends of Phil got promoted. Some of them are probably sitting in the viewing room watching this debate this evening. It is imperative that women know that they're going to be listened to. And as I said, one of the benefits of the Me Too movement is that now our daughters and our granddaughters know that they are going to be heard. Congressman, thank you. Governor, would you like to respond? Sure. I mean, Congressman, I can't imagine how you can possibly say that. It does not comport to the facts. The, the individual who performed these acts was gone the next day from the governor's office. Um, the woman who, was, um, uh, who had been assaulted um, had all the support we could possibly give her in human resources, did not change her job in any way. What you're saying, Congressman, is just flat wrong. All right, Congressman, would you like to respond? Well, uh, the, it was reported in the Associated Press and in the Tennessee, and so I guess what uh, Phil is saying is that they and their reporting was flat wrong. Governor, 15 seconds. Uh, I, have nothing, I have certainly had nothing to add to that. I know what the facts of the matter were. That woman was protected in every way we knew how. All right, Governor. Congressman, thank you. Richard? Thank you. All right, thank you, Kristen. Candidates, let's move on to health care next. Mm -hmm. According to a recent poll by NBC News SurveyMonkey, one of the things Tennessee voters mm -hmm. care most about is health care. Now, we know the three most popular aspects of the Affordable Care Act are coverage for pre-existing conditions, staying on your parents' health insurance until you're 26 years old, and the no lifetime cap on health care expenses. Governor Bredesen, we'll start with you. Will you support making those provisions part of a future overhaul of the ACA? Um, those, um, those items are, are very important, and yes, the answer is certainly will support it. You know, I, um, I was not a supporter of the ACA, I'll be honest, when it came out. I believed that once it became the law of the land, it was our obligation to move forward and to support it. Uh, and it has done a number of, uh, a number of good, uh, good things. Um, one of the most important is this protection against pre-existing conditions. Uh, because if you have those conditions today, it is really only a major corporation's health plan or a big union plan or the Affordable Care Act that provide any protections for those. Um, and when you do, as the congressman has done, which is to vote time and time again to repeal the Affordable Care Act without having anything to replace it, you are in effect voting to remove any ability of someone with pre-existing conditions to obtain health insurance. I think that's just wrong. How about that, Congressman Blackburn? Those three provisions that are so important to the public, what would you do about those three in terms of any Actually, reform? Actually, every plan that I have voted for includes pre-existing conditions, and that was a Republican provision, as was older children staying on their parents' plans. And uh, that is something that is going to stay there. Now, we know if Phil had his way and Hillary were president, he gave her $33,400, wanted her to be president, Hillary Clinton is the mother of government-run health care. That is a concept that Phil supports. He's written a book about it in Fresh Medicine, talks about putting a 20% surcharge on your income in order to pay for it. Tennesseans do not want government control health care. Tennesseans want to be able to make their health care decisions with their physicians, and that is something that I support. Giving Tennesseans that power, my goodness, we know what TennCare and what the Affordable Care Act has done to Tennessee. Today, you've got... Governor Bredesen, you get 30 seconds for a rebuttal. Yeah. The, um, um, I've heard so much about this, this book. If, if you had actually read the book, Congressman, which I suspect you haven't, 
Um, in, the, in the introduction, I talk about the importance of not having the Congress and the leadership designing a health plan for this country, but instead setting up the incentives so that the sort of very muscular economic system that we have in our country um, and the creativity we have can solve this problem for us. Congressman Blackburn, your turn. Actually, Phil said that Washington Democrats knew how to solve uh, health care and I think the, the private sector knows how to solve access to health care. He also said this was Barack Obama's most significant achievement. Health insurance costs in Tennessee have gone up 176 percent under the Affordable Care Act. So many Tennesseans have been priced out of the health insurance marketplace. We had 160,000 Tennessee families have to pay the insurance penalty well, last year. As a follow-up, cost is an issue, no question. Yes. So Governor Bredesen, uh, you say you're in favor of keeping those three provisions that are so popular. How on earth would you pay for them? Well, that's, that is obviously the entire issue with having these is how you, is how you pay for it. Uh, the Affordable Care Act was paid for with a combination of things, um, which um, uh, of various, uh, various pieces, um, and those I think could be used as the basis for, uh, for putting together a, a better system which is a little more responsive. But you know, right now we have the Affordable Care Act. We have 225,000 Tennesseans who are depending on it for their health care. And I think the sort of voting... Okay, Congressman, uh, just to clarify, you're for all three of those provisions, keeping those, am I correct? The, These uh, are things that have been included in bills that we have. So how would you continue to pay for those? One of the things that has to be done is opening up the marketplace. The, the Affordable Care Act is unaffordable. People cannot afford this. Open up the marketplace. A cross-state line purchase of health insurance is something that will allow individuals, families, to buy insurance that meets their needs at a price that they can afford. Now, Phil and Hillary Clinton, who he wanted to be president, would like to have government-run health care, Hillary Care. All right, thank you. Candidates, Bob. Thank you, Richard. Candidates, let's talk about Social Security. This is the first time in decades the Social Security program will have to dip into its own reserves to cover benefits. Also, projections from the Social Security Boards of Trustees show the trust fund will be depleted by 2034. Obviously, a fix is needed. Would you support raising the retirement age over the current cap of 67 years of age to maintain full benefits? Congressman? Uh, thank you so much for that. One of the things we hear from our current seniors is why in the world doesn't Congress move forward and establish Medicare and Social Security as the trust funds because of the long-term liabilities on these? Making certain that we give our seniors current seniors assurance that these are going to stay in place and that their benefits are not going to be diminished. That is something that is very important. Now, Phil supported Barack Obama and called Obamacare his significant achievement and that took $700 billion out of the Medicare Trust Fund. This is unfair to our seniors. It is money that has come out of their paychecks. It is money that should be there for them, for their health care and for their retirement needs. Thank you, Congressman. Governor, would you consider raising the cap? Um, the Social Security, Social Security is a trust fund. It's the only pure trust fund uh, we really have for any of those, any of those programs. Uh, it has begun to dip into it now, and in another uh, 10 or 15 years, it will have done, it done itself out. Um, I do not uh, support in any way, in, in essence, reducing the benefits by either raising the uh, by either raising the age or any of the other mechanisms for doing that. Um, I think we should do what Ronald Reagan did during that time, which is ultimately step up to a small increase in the Social Security tax to fully fund the Social Security Trust Fund. Uh, part of the strength of that program has always been that it is properly funded through this tax and uh, and people can be assured of having those benefits when they are um, uh, when they're available um, medicare part a the trust fund the hospital part it has problems as well um, and they, these need to be dealt with in a host of ways and I, there's a lot of ways to reduce actually the costs and the draw on that thank you governor congressman your rebuttal uh yes Social Security does not operate as a trust fund as it should because they write an IOU and put the money in the general fund and they spend it. Barack Obama 
ran our debt in this country from $10 trillion to $21 trillion. In my opinion, that is something that is absolutely immoral. Now, Phil and the Washington Democrats would take us back to those Obama-Clinton policies and continue to spend that Thank money. Thank you, Congressman. Governor, your rebuttal. Uh, there is no question but that the uh, trust fund has been invested essentially in Treasury securities. It is still a trust fund. Uh, and frankly, I think it's better to have the money in Treasury securities than it is having a huge impact, for example, of having the government own large parts of the stock market, which is what would happen if, uh, uh, if you made other kinds of purchases with it. It is a trust fund. It is segregated in that sense. Uh, and they have the most secure uh, uh, collateral available, which is, uh, which is uh, U.S. Treasury securities. That's right. Thank you both. Kristen? All right, Bob, thank you. A uh, time now to talk gun control. There has been a lot of debate about mental illness and guns. In fact, we have seen at least one incident here in Tennessee where mental health has played a part in a mass shooting after four people were killed at an Antioch Waffle House. So candidates, we are going to do something a little bit different with this question. We're going to give you both time to elaborate on your thoughts on this. But first, we want to get a show of hands. A show of hands, raise your hand if you are in favor of enhancing the red flag system, which identifies people with or who have suspicion of mental health issues as part of background checks for gun buyers. Okay, Governor, we're going to start with you. Both of you, I want to go on the record, raising your hand. Uh, please elaborate, Governor. Okay, um, these school shootings, first of all, are unbelievably difficult for this country. I can't even imagine what it's like to be a parent of a student, uh, a student in that school, let alone a parent whose child had been killed or seriously injured in, in, that, in that fashion. Um, I think there are some basic sound things that we can do, uh, including enhancing background checks, properly funding NICS, but one of the most important things will be to have some mechanism to identify people who, from a mental health perspective, uh, are not suitable for, uh, for handling, for handling owning, owning weapons. Um, uh, I think that had such a thing been in place, uh, there's two of these last three school shootings that I think could have been prevented. I think it should be judicially mandated, not something which is done by an administrator somewhere to give people protections against it being used arbitrarily. But I think one of the most effective things we could ever do to prevent these violences is to get serious about keeping guns out of the hands of people who are problematical. Governor, thank you. Uh, again, Congressman, you also raised your hand in support of a red flag system for background checks. Uh, explain why. Yes, and I will tell you, I think that we can protect the Second Amendment and also protect our citizens in public places. That is something that we've done throughout our nation's history. And I have supported enhancing the NICS system. And no one, I will tell you, nobody wants someone who is a danger to themselves or others to have a firearm in their possession. And I have, I've been a room mother and have spent time in schools. And you want to make certain those children are safe, hardening those schools, making those resources available. I am endorsed by the Fraternal Order of Police because they know that I work carefully with them. I'm also endorsed by the NRA. I have an A rating from them. Phil and I each sought their endorsement. He has a D rating from them. Now, if you had the Democrats in control and if Hillary Clinton, who he wanted to be president, was president, you would see them taking away your guns. Congressman, thank you. Governor, 30 seconds for rebuttal. Um, <laughs> Um, I want to just reaffirm again, please, that uh, I have been a gun owner all of my life. I grew up in a rural community. Um, uh, I have been a strong supporter of Second Amendment rights. I think those are important rights uh, of, of American citizens. And I think the way we exercise those rights responsibly, as with anything else, is by putting reasonable kinds of controls in place. I got crossways with the NRA because I vetoed a bill that allowed people to carry guns in bars. I thought that was crazy. It was stupid. Uh, I vetoed the bill, and it made them very mad. Governor, thank you. Congressman? Uh, yes, Phil was in New York last night he, uh, with Michael Bloomberg, who Michael Bloomberg is one of the leading advocates for gun control in this country. I fully believe we can protect the Second Amendment and we can protect guns 
your right to own a gun. You know, the Democrats bring you judges and justices like Soto, Soto, so, Sonia Sotomayor, who says she does not think you have a fundamental right to own a gun. Congressman, thank you. Richard? Let's have one more question related to the Second Amendment. Uh, just last week, President Trump announced a ban on bump stocks is coming. In fact, during a news conference at the White House, he said, we are knocking out bump stocks. I have told the National Rifle Association, bump stocks are gone. Bump stocks, of course, allow semi-automatic weapons to operate like a fully automatic gun, but some gun advocates oppose the president on this issue. Under any conditions, Congressman Blackburn, you first on this one, would you consider restricting or banning military assault style weapons or any device that could modify firearms in this way? Uh, thank you for that. And uh, I will tell you, this is something that the House has already done. And of course, one of the reasons I'm running for the Senate is because the place is dysfunctional and uh, they don't get around to taking up some of the things that are there that they ought to be taking up. Dealing with bump stocks is a great example of that. You know, hearts were just absolutely broken with what happened in Las Vegas. And you had the Nashville community, the music community, very affected by that. But if you had the Democrats and the Washington Democrats in, in control, they will tell you one of the things that they want to do is to diminish your Second Amendment rights. That is not what Tennesseans want. Now, Phil would be there, right there with the Washington Democrats. And he was at Michael Bloomberg's last night. That is a focus of gun control. Tennesseans want to make certain that we do this the right way. Governor Burson, your turn. Under any con conditions, would you consider uh, banning uh, military assault style weapons or devices that can turn them into that? Well, <clears throat> first of all, the bump stocks turn weapons into something, I think, which is more effective, more uh, dangerous uh, than, um, uh, than, a, than a straight military-style weapon because it involves a much more rapid uh, kind of fire than, a, than you can get with, a, uh, with one of these assault, assault rifles. Uh, I absolutely believe the bump stocks ought to be banned. It's a good example of reasonable restrictions that uh, help, help keep and protect our Second Amendment rights. Um, I think the, uh, the cat is out of the bag, as it were, with the assault weapons. There are somewhere between 10, 10 and 20 million of them uh, in the country today. Uh, and absent, uh, you know, uh, with that as a fact, um, uh, I, I just can't see where that could ever possibly be practical. I also know an awful lot of people who, uh, who enjoy owning them and enjoy using them for hunting, uh, and I think do, do not represent any danger to anyone. Um, I just want to reaffirm one more time um, that I strongly support the right of any citizen to own weapons subject to reasonable restrictions like we've described. Congressman, you get 30 seconds for a rebuttal. One of the things we want to do, as I said, is make certain that we protect the Second Amendment. This is what Tennesseans continue to say to me. Let's protect people in our public spaces. Let's make certain that we harden our schools, that we new, use new technologies on those schools, but that we protect the Second Amendment. And I am, again, endorsed by the NRA, have an A rating from the NRA, and look forward to continuing to work with the Fraternal Order of Police on public safety. Final say, 30 seconds in your rebuttal, Governor. Um, simp simply to say again that, um, you know, I really believe that uh, Americans, there are a lot of Americans who, uh, from all different parts of the political spectrum, this is not a Democratic, Republican issue or a liberal, conservative issue, uh, who enjoy and treasure the right to own arms, understand that there should be reasonable restrictions on things like bump stocks and um, and the, the stuff we've talked about before with mental health. Uh, and I, to me, that is a sound place to do. I do not think this is a partisan issue. All right, thank you, candidates. We're almost halfway through what will be the last debate between the two of you. Katina? All right, Richard, thank you so much. You are watching the Tennessee Senate debate, and we are broadcasting live all across the state of Tennessee. A reminder here to follow the hashtag TNSenateDebate. There you will get background information on the candidates as well as some live updates. We are back in a moment with more questions for the candidates.